Thank you, Kevin Buzzard. Um, right. These, uh, these things happen. <laughs> yeah. I'll, so, yeah, I'll get please, going. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, so, thank you to Narad and to Manon for the invitation. I mean, especially this is quite a strange talk because I appreciate that uh, you're, you're normally expecting to hear combinatorics on words. And so, just for a word of background, uh, I work in a maths department. I'm an algebraic number theorist. Uh, I'm not a computer scientist. Five years ago, I was doing something completely different. You know, I was working in the Langlands philosophy, so, you know, big machinery, uh, pure mathematics. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why I switched and, and why I think that, you know, what I now do is kind of interesting. So uh, as Jeff and I have already established uh, <clears throat> in the chat before I started, the traditional use of computers in mathematics and one you'll be hearing about next week is to compute. Uh, <clears throat> so here's, here's, you know, here's a list of some computer algebra packages that I thought of when I was preparing this talk. Uh, these are the, and actually we used to teach some of these at Imperial to the mathematicians, but now we, we used to teach Mathematica and MATLAB, but now we teach them Python even uh, because somehow they're interested in using it for machine learning. Uh, but we do teach the undergraduates and, and have in the past taught the undergraduates things like this. So uh, these are sort of the traditional uses of computers by mathematicians. I mean, uh, by you know, algebraists and number theorists use them uh, to do, you know, there's a big number theory database of things like modular forms and number fields and elliptic curves uh, generated often using software like this. Uh, so people might be familiar with these sorts of things. Uh, but there's this, there's this different way of using computers, uh, which has been around for just as long, but somehow has been uh, less, less popular in mathematics departments at least, which is to use them to reason, to prove theorems. So here's some examples of, you know, and again, there's a list as long as my arm of, uh, of computer proof systems, you know, like computer algebra systems. So here's, here's the list of some of, some of these. And, uh, Maybe if you have a computer science background, you might well know about some of these or even have used them. But uh, if you're a mathematician, uh, you've probably not used uh, these systems and probably haven't even heard of them. So, I mean, like, like me four years ago, I hadn't really heard of them. So let me, let me just start by explaining the difference uh, between these two systems. So uh, let's see if I can do... I'm, here, let's fire up Parry GP. I'm rather hoping that now you can all see uh, you can you can see a big like dark purple screen now. Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. So so this is just a, a normal computer algebra package. This is Parry GP. Uh, so we could do I don't know for n is one up to a thousand. Uh, if n is prime, if is prime n, uh, then we could print n right. There you go. There's all the primes between one and a thousand, just sort of generated instantly. I mean, if I go up to ten thousand, it still generates them instantly. In fact, the, the you know the, it takes a long time to print them out. The actual computation is instant, and then all the time it takes is just outputting the results to the screen. Uh, and obviously, you could go on. You know, I could go up to I could go up to a larger. So there we go. So this is evidence that there's infinitely many primes. But of course, it's not a proof that there's infinitely many primes. You see, so that, that's that's what computers do when you read, you know, when you uh, when you compute with them. They can just give you lots and lots of examples of the things you're thinking about. Uh, so let me now try and switch over to here's lean. So this is lean. Uh, so this is a this is a computer proof system. And so. And so what goes on here is rather different. So I, we can do things like, I don't know, we could do topology, like import, uh, I don't know what do we do, topology.continuousfunction.basic, there we go. Uh, and, and, now, and now we can, now I've got access to variables like this, variables. So what's a topological space? It's you know, a set uh, with a topological space structure. So let's make some topological spaces. This is type theory, not set theory. Uh, so I need uh, let x be a, let x. So this says 
So I'm going to write let let x, y, and z be topological spaces. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to write that in this funny language. So topological space x. Uh, there we go. So you see, for a computer algebra package, you can do calculations with elliptic curves, say, uh, yeah, or modular forms, or whatever you're interested in. But the idea is you would choose an explicit elliptic curve with numbers in. And uh, an elliptic curve uh, is like y squared equals x cubed plus 3x plus 7. You know, that's an explicit example of an elliptic curve. But here, this is different, right? x, y, and z are not explicit topological spaces. They're just, you know, they're just general topological spaces here. So let uh, f from x to y and g from y to z uh, be functions. So let's have variables f from x to y and g from y to z there. So now we've got functions between our topological spaces. And now the kind of thing we can do in this system is we can prove a theorem about these functions. So let's do a theorem. Let's, let's just call it an example. Uh, let's have the hypothesis uh, that uh, Let's say that f is continuous and that g is continuous. Uh, then my conclusion is that uh, the composite continuous f, what would it be? G composed with f. There. So there's the setup. Uh, and so now the idea is we're going to prove a theorem. I'm going to prove that the, the composite of two continuous functions is continuous. Uh, and on the left here, so this is. It's like a computer game now, right? This is a puzzle. Uh, so here's uh, what's going on. The what's going on on the right here. Uh, this is the current state of our puzzle, right? The, the, the aim is the aim is to prove a theorem, and this is the theorem we have to prove. This is weird little sideways T symbol, uh, which you kind of see if you do a logic course in the maths department, and uh, you might see more of in the computer science department, but. Uh, in, you know, as a mathematics undergraduate, I saw this course, this theorem in precisely this symbol in precisely one course, the logic course. Uh, and the idea is everything, the thing to the right of the symbol is what we want to prove. And the stuff above it uh, is all our hypotheses. So our hypotheses are x, y, z are topological spaces, f and g are functions, f and g are continuous functions. We have to prove the composition is continuous. So that's the, that's the kind of the, that's the status of Lean's brain right now. That's the status of the puzzle we're solving. And then we solve the puzzle over here by making moves. We simply make moves here. Right. There. And, and the moves are mathematical observations. Uh, so how are we going to prove this? Well, firstly, I guess we need to think about what the definition of continuous is. Uh, continuous function between topological spaces means the pre-image of an open set is open. Uh, so let's change continuous. Let's rewrite uh, continuous def. Uh, yeah, that's the definition of continuous function. So there we go. Now you see now things have changed over here. Uh, now now you see you see the HF used to say I can I can show I can move this around right. The HF used to say that f was continuous, and now it says for all subsets of y which are open, the pre-image under f is open, and similarly. This goal here, this used to say that G was continuous, and now it says for all subsets, for all open subsets Z of G, uh, the pre-image under, under, sorry, for all open subsets of Z, the pre-image under G is open as well. And our goal uh, is for all subsets, for all open subsets of Z, the pre-image is open. If I pull back uh, along the composite map, G composed with F. So that's, uh, so that's what the uh, that's what the goal is now, and so how are we going to prove for all open subsets of Z? Blah blah blah. Let's let U be an open subset. So so it's U H U. So this says let U be an open subset of Z, and now I've got to prove that the pre-image when I pull back under this composite function G composed with F, I've got to prove the pre-image is open. So what's the maths proof? I mean, uh, you know, we we need to know the maths proof. So I guess the idea is. Uh, what have we got? U is a subset of Z. Uh, so let's define V to be the pre-image of U. And let's let V uh, be the uh, pre-image of U under G. There, let's do that. Uh, U. I've got this little, you, you wonder why I didn't just write G inverse of U, but G inverse has kind of been stolen by group theory. G inverse is the inverse in a group. And this is a function, and functions don't form a group. So I've got some weird primed by this 
And mathematicians are very good at overloading notation. So V is now the pre-image of U, uh, so it's a subset of Y. This set Y means a subset of Y. It means a set of elements of Y. Uh, and now we need, to, we need that it's open, right? Have H V uh, is, is open V. There, I claim that this thing is open. So now Lee says, okay, so you've got to prove it's open. Uh, so why is it open? Well, U was open and, uh, and what? And G is continuous. So let's apply, let's apply the hypothesis that G is continuous. And Lean now says, okay, now you've got to prove that U is open, but we know that U is open already. So that's an assumption. So you see this, this stuff on the left is, you know, is difficult for someone that doesn't know Lean's, I'm just writing in Lean's tactic language right now. Uh, so this, is, this stuff on the left is difficult to follow, but you can see what's happening on the right here. So now we have V as the pre-image of U, and we have the hypothesis that V is open. So we must be done there. Uh, so now we just need to use continuity of F for exact, uh, HF is the continuity of F, uh, and we apply it to the set of V and the proof that V is open. Uh, there we go. And now I get the bugs, right? Now it says goals accomplished. It, yeah, it used to be, it used to look like this, but uh, now it says goals accomplished. And now I have an error uh, here. Now, now it's complaining that uh, I'm apologizing because I haven't finished yet, but I don't need to apologize anymore because I've finished. Uh, so that's, that's a proof from first principles that a uh, pre-image of a continuous function is continuous. Uh, so as you can imagine, sorry, it's a proof that, yeah, composite for continuous functions is continuous. Uh, and as you can imagine, that's not really what you want to do uh, in practice if, you're, if you want to you know, do serious mathematics. You don't want to spend one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines doing this. And so there's other ways to do it as well. In fact, I didn't tell you this, but uh, in fact, there's a general continuity tactic. If I type continuity, it should do it, I think. There we go. So that's also a proof. You see, I have goals accomplished again. So this is a one-line proof uh, that the pre-image of uh, sorry that the composite of two continuous functions is continuous, and that proof has worked uh, because basically there's a general machine for attempting to prove that functions are continuous, and it knows things like pullback of continuous functions is continuous, and you know, product of continuous functions is continuous, and composite of continuous functions is continuous. So we have a sort of a general all-purpose tactic. Uh, that means you can do it quickly, uh, you know, and that that will prove that general tactic will prove lots of complicated things, you know. If I, uh, that will that will do sort of basic simple diagram chases, but as you can imagine, just proving that the the composite of two continuous functions is continuous, I mean that's going to be in the library already, so I can type library search. So that looks through Lean's maths library and it, look it finds it here if I click here now, there. So there's another one line proof. Uh, which says this is exactly the statement continuous.conf and continuous.conf is just the statement uh, that the composite of two continuous functions is continuous. So there's another proof. And in fact, the shortest proof, I guess, would just be to, to use that directly. If I just do, if I just do, I guess it's just hg.conf hf. Uh, you see computer scientists like incredibly short proof. So there's a, there's a proof that the composite of continuous functions is continuous, which is just 10 characters long. You see, and things like this are important to have if you actually want to do mathematics. You know, it's not just about doing mathematics in these systems. You have to do mathematics somehow effectively. Uh, you know, I would like to be able to do it at kind of the same speed as I can lecture it. So it's kind of important that, uh, that you can do things like that. So that's what a computer proof system looks like. And you can, you know, you can prove abstract theorems. And let me stress again, this is not a theorem about specific topological spaces. You know, I've just proved a theorem about all topological spaces. Uh, let me now switch back. So, so that's kind of interesting, the fact that these systems exist. Uh, and I think it's also interesting that on the whole, universities don't teach uh, their students how to use them because they've been around for, they've been around for 50 years, the, you know, the earlier systems. And it, and it turns out that uh, in fact, people are being taught how to use them, but not in maths departments. There's, there, there are courses in computer science departments uh, which teach students how to use these computer proof systems. And this kind of raises, you know, this, this, this traditional fact, you know, this, this has been true for, for a long time now. And it has somehow, in some sense, greatly warped 
the kind of mathematics which gets done in these systems. Because computer scientists on the whole aren't really interested in topological spaces. You know, they're interested in you know, they're interested in logic and uh, you know typically foundational issues. Or uh, you know, they're certainly not interested in sort of research level mathematics. They they might well not, not understand what's going on in a maths department. So they do the kind of mathematics which they run into in computer science departments, uh, which is a different, you know, it's a different story. So I've introduced a course in my department now. Uh, we've started to teach math students how to use these systems. And uh, we've, 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 I mean, I started a few years ago. I, I started informally by just starting a club. Uh, I, I started a formalizing club, but it caught on. And eventually they asked me to turn this into a proper course. So, um, uh, so I'm now teaching math students properly how to use these systems. And this, and this talk is, you know, some, some, of the, some of the stuff in this talk will be somehow explaining how that's happened. But one of the funny consequences of this is the system I showed you, Lean, there's several systems, but Lean is one of them. And uh, it turns out now that I've built a research group uh, because some students got into it and they've worked quite a lot on it in their spare time. And now they're world experts in using, in using this software. I mean, some of them are better than me. So that's the, the, you know, the joy of teaching young people, is that especially young people who are on top of the curriculum and are sailing through it. And, you know, if you leave them to their own devices, they'll just play World of Warcraft or something. But if you get them addicted to this, uh, then they'll become world experts in the Lean Theorem Prover. And all of a sudden you've made a research group out of undergraduates. It is difficult to tell, I mean, they're a research group in a slightly strange way. I mean, it's, it's difficult to tell them what to do. You can suggest things, but it's not like you can't give them, give them a job. I'm not their boss somehow, I'm their collaborator. Uh, you know, getting them to do things is like herding cats sometimes. So anyway, I've talked a bit about Lean. I've shown you Lean. Uh, Lean is, it's a free and open source computer proof system. You can just download it onto your computer. Uh, and, uh, and prove theorems yourself, you can play around with it. But there's others as well. And uh, so I'd like to mention COC, which is another free and open source computer proof system. And this is one of the, this is a really powerful system. It's existed for over 30 years. There's some serious stuff in it. And they verified uh, the odd order theorem, the fight Thompson odd order theorem in COC. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of other mathematics as well. But then there's also plenty of stuff which is more on the computer science side. And uh, there's Isabel Hall, again, a, a free and open source computer proof system that's uh, based in Cambridge, UK. Cambridge and Munich are the two places where this thing was developed. But again, it was sort of developed in the, in the computer science department in Cambridge. You see, for me, I, I think that get, getting young Cambridge mathematicians addicted to this is somehow high priority for me. But the, the problem is the expert users are all in the computer science department and that they're somehow you know, there's there's not enough discussion between the two departments. Uh, so why do computer scientists keep writing computer systems if mathematicians don't use them? I think this is the first obvious question uh, because you know I've listed ten and uh, and uh, you know there are more. And so why do people keep writing these things? And uh, and the answer is it's it's slightly surprising. It's a uh, it's kind of a fluke in some sense. That these systems can be used to do mathematics because to a large extent they're being designed uh, for a completely different reason they're being designed to find bugs in computer code uh, so the idea is you write your computer code and then you use your computer proof system to prove that the computer code does what it's supposed to do and the reason these systems appear is because it's really important not to have bugs in computer code code runs the world right code keeps airplanes in the sky you know code Code makes hospitals work. Code, I mean, code makes it. Code makes transport systems work. Code makes lots of things work. You know, just to give an example, I remember in the 1990s, you know, when I was a when I was a PhD student, there was this Pentium FDIV bug. Uh, if you had a computer in the 1990s, it was either a PC or a Mac. I mean, very much like now. And if you had a PC in it, it was going to have a Pentium chip in it. And uh, this Pentium, the newest Pentium chip, uh, would occasionally return incorrect values when you divided a real number by another real number, a floating point real number by another one. And uh, it was a very rare, it was a very rare occurrence, but it did, you know, it was discovered by a mathematician uh, who, who found some you know, inconsistencies. 
and uh, Pentium were forced because of a public outcry to, to, to basically replace every single one of these uh, chips. And it cost them a huge amount of money. And this was 20 years ago. So nowadays it's, uh, you know, buggy code cost, you know, it could be even more costly. You know, buggy code can, can cost lives as well. I mean, uh, this, is a, this is a serious industry. So these systems have been written, uh, you know, amongst other reasons, but this was very much a driving reason, I think, to verify that computer code functions correctly. And because computer programs and mathematics, mathematical proofs and computer programs are very similar things. I mean, there are theorems in this direction saying that certain kinds of mathematical proofs are really equal to certain kinds of computer programs. Uh, and so the same systems which can be used uh, to verify computer proofs can also be used to prove theorems in pure mathematics. And you know that was what you saw me doing earlier. Uh, so that's why these things exist, and it's also why somehow they're more used in computer science departments. But you know the thing I'm pushing right now is perhaps we should start using them in mathematics departments uh, to do you know anything which is pure mathematics, you know anything uh, anything which is you know well specified where we have rigorous definitions of everything. Uh, so let me just briefly explain uh, how I got interested. So just a, a few slides on sort of my story. Uh, so I, I decided that, you know, I, I was aware that these systems existed and I wondered whether I could use them for teaching. Uh, I, I wondered whether I could start persuading, uh, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was told to teach this introduction to proof course that we have. At Imperial, where you you know you teach students basic, you know you teach them the difference between equals and the implied symbol, and, uh, and you teach the very basic stuff. You know, e to the i theta is cos theta plus i sine theta, you know basic number theory, and then do stuff like injective and surjective functions, and equivalence relations and stuff like this. And I thought this is all very basic mathematics, so it should be very easy to do in these theorem proofs. And uh, I thought that if I could maybe persuade some students to do it, it would teach the weak students. When people write, the, you know, it would stop the weak students writing vague arguments because it would force them to, uh, to write everything sort of correctly and properly and somehow see. Uh, it, it would stop them, you know, confusing for all epsilon their exists a delta with their exists a delta such that for all epsilon, because in these systems you can't get it the wrong way around, you know. Uh, so this was my initial motivation. I wondered whether I could use use this stuff for teaching. Uh, so I started doing my own problem sheets. I mean, the problem sheets I was going to give out these students in October 2017. Over the summer of 2017, I started to do them myself. And this is this is this is a, a true story, a genuine true story. This is the first part of the first question of the first problem sheet, uh, which I give to the students. So true or false. If x is a real number, then x squared minus 3x plus 2 equals 0 implies x equals 1. Uh, and of course, the idea is I'm trying to teach them what this implication symbol means, because at school it's used very vaguely. You know, this implica implies and equals are kind of almost synonymous. So this quadratic's got two roots, x equals 1 and x equals 2. And so this is false. But, uh, you know, I just want to check that they understand this. So in the model answer, it just says false, you know, let x be 2. Uh, because then the left hand side is obviously true and the right hand side is obviously false. So you type this into lean and lean instantly says, OK, so now it suffices to prove true two things. Right. First, you've got to prove that the left hand side, you've got to prove two squared minus three times two plus two is zero. And secondly, you've got to prove that two is not equal to one. Uh, so, of course, I, I thought this was very funny because I thought we were done. Whereas when you think about it logically, we're not done. Right. Because we do have to prove these two things. But of course, <laughs> I also realized that I had no idea how to prove these things. Uh, because, I mean, they're, they're both obvious, right, as far as I'm concerned. But this computer proof system is just sitting there saying, OK, you're go you know, there's this sideways T. And after it, there's the statement that 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2 equals 0. And I'm thinking, well, I need, you know, what's the definition of multiplication here? I mean, what's, uh, so I asked on the lean chat, there's a 24-7 there's a helpline for lean, uh, there's a lean chat. So I popped onto the lean chat and asked about how to solve this problem. And the first question they said, well, what do you mean by two? Is that like the natural number two or the real number two? Uh, 
And I said it was the real number two. And they were like, oh, that's hard, you know, because real numbers are equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rationals. So uh, they're sort of difficult to work with. Uh, and I was just thinking, well, this is ridiculous. If I can't do the first question, this is never going anywhere. But, uh, but what, what I need really is not a proof from first principles. I don't really want to start considering equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rationals. If I, I, you know, I most definitely do not want to do that. Uh, but a week later, somebody on the lean chat had written a new tactic. And uh, the new tactic, you know, the normalized numerals tactic, like, like I showed you the continuity tactic. They wrote a tactic that dealt with numbers, with real numbers, and it solved both of these goals. And that just sort of reflects, you know, what was going on with Lean. They had a lot of mach you know, they had machinery to do stuff, but they hadn't bothered to write a tactic that could prove that the real numbers one and two were distinct. But now mathematicians come along saying they need it. And uh, so they're like, oh yeah, we can do that. Uh, and this is somehow when I realized that somehow there was a lot of synergy here. You know, I said, can we, you know, can we change the system to make it so I can use it? And they were like, yeah, that's it's easy, you know. Just, you know, what else do you need? Uh, <clears throat> so what I needed, so question two, sheet two was about square roots, and that was good fun. They didn't have square roots, uh, but I just made square roots. You know, I defined the square root of a positive real to be some supremum of all the real numbers whose square was less than x. I proved basic facts about, you know, the facts about suprema were already there. And uh, I made square roots and did sheet two. Sheet three was about complex numbers. Uh, and lean didn't have complex numbers. It had real numbers, but it didn't have complex numbers. But that's fine. I just defined a complex number, right? And the definition of a complex number in lean is just a pair of real numbers. And, uh, and then I defined addition and multiplication of complex numbers and proved they were a commutative real. <clears throat> and then, you know, later on, somebody else came along and proved they were a field. And later on, someone else came along and proved they were an algebraic equation. Uh, but back to my course, you know, I needed e to the i theta is cos theta plus i sine theta. And all of a sudden, this is problematic. Uh, because to prove this, I mean, you, you, how you have to define sine and cosine, and there's, you know, they, you naturally define them as sums of infinite power series, really. That's the, somehow the, that's the, you know, the, my instinct. Uh, but um, then you have to start proving that you can rearrange power series within their radius of convergence to prove things like this. And, uh, you know, that really belongs in the analysis course. The idea is this is supposed to be informal, really. I hadn't really realized, uh, somehow when I started to think about this, I hadn't really realized that this is supposed to be some introduction to proof, but I'm still using, we're not doing everything from first principles. It hadn't really dawned on me that this was the case. Uh, so I thought that was quite interesting. So this, this stuff here, it was a problem, right? But there was some undergraduate coming to my club. So I said, well, why don't you prove that, you know, you can rearrange power series within their radius of convergence because you're going to be learning that next term anyway. Uh, so, you know, I started giving students problems. Uh, then we did basic number theory and congruences in my course. These were much easier. Uh, and we finish off in my course doing things like injective and surjective functions and equivalence relations. And these were really easy uh, because an equivalence relation, you just define it, right? You define reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and then you develop the theory of things like equivalence classes and quotients, you know, just using nothing more than those axioms. We don't need, by, by now I'm coming to realize that the complex numbers are a really complicated machine. You know, they, you know, they're pairs of real numbers and real numbers are equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rationals and rationals are localizations of integers. And you know, there's, there's a whole lot of machinery that you have to learn before you can drive the real numbers really, until we start putting in the interface that means that students don't have to learn that, uh, that, that machinery. So this is what's missing, but equivalence relations, you don't need the framework, you know, you don't need the interface. You, you can just read them directly from the axioms. You type in the axioms, and then everything follows from the axioms. Uh, so then a bright student, you see, I was hoping to get to the weak students, but then a bright student came along and said that equivalence relations were a bit abstract for them, uh, but they were coming to my club. Of course, you know, I was attempting to attract the, the weak students, but the bright students were thinking, oh, this is crazy. Uh, this bright student came along. Uh, so didn't really understand what was going on in the lecture. So tried doing some of the problem sheets in Lean and then they got it. So this forced me to kind of reevaluate what was going on a little bit, uh, because in fact, it was the bright students that were flocking to this stuff. Uh, and then of course they started getting better than me, you know, which is somehow, I mean, 
it, it would have been humiliating, but for the fact that I'd seen this happen, I have teenage children that are sort of better than me at lots of things. And so I'd seen it happening already. You know, when, they, when they're eight, you're better than them at most things, but somehow by, by the time they're, you know, by the time they're 17, they're much better than you at some things. Uh, so I told this very bright first year undergraduate to try for, you know, he, he wanted something, he needed a project. So I gave him a project. I gave him a tier in McDonald's, this sort of standard MSc level textbook on commutative algebra and said, why don't you formalize the first couple of chapters? But it, because it also, it was beginning to dawn on me what was easy and what was hard. And equi equivalence relations were easy. So the theory of commutative rings was gonna be easy, even though we don't teach it until they're MSc students. And all this stuff with the real numbers is still right now quite difficult to work with because we don't have the machinery. Uh, you know, machinery for dealing with equivalence classes. We don't have, you know, we don't have the stuff that means that students don't have to think about equivalence classes or Cauchy sequences. So I gave this guy, you know, a book on commutative ring theory and told him to develop the theory of localizations. And two weeks later, he'd done it. Uh, so I taught a first year undergraduate some MSc level mathematics. And, you know, he could prove he'd done it because he'd formalized the universal property and everything. Uh, so, I, you know, he needed another project. So I said, well, why don't we formalize, you know, Groth and Deke's definition of a scheme? Uh, because you need localization to do that. And I thought that would be a really nice goal. And uh, so Hughes was getting good as well. Uh, we needed some results, uh, some results about Hughes was doing sort of basic stuff in finite group theory. He'd become an expert in finiteness. Finiteness is difficult in these languages. Finiteness is a subtle concept like the real numbers. But Hughes had mastered finiteness, which we needed. I knew all the topology. Uh, I mean, I knew everything, but I knew how to do topology in Lean. And, and Lau had, had done localization. So the three of us together, you know, we'd just meet together. We were doing it just informally on these Thursday evenings. And uh, a few months into it all, we had a definition. We were proving lemmas about schemes from, you know, from uh, algebraic geometry textbooks. So this was quite good fun. And as I say, my initial plan to teach weak students epsilon delta arguments was now out the window. And my new plan, you know, was to teach first year undergraduates Groth and Deke's theory of schemes, uh, which I, you know, I was just having fun. That was all, you know, it seemed like a great thing. And uh, so then I thought, you know, I'm, I'm using this one system lean. I wasn't wedded to lean at this point. Uh, I started asking uh, you know, how this was done in the other systems, because obviously lean, was, lean is quite new. Lean has only been around uh, for a few years. So I started asking around how this had been done in the other systems, like Koch, because it's you know, 30 years old. And you know, people sort of say, well, you know, no one's done anything like this before. And uh, so th this, to me, was the big shock, right? That I, you know, something that started off as a hobby, uh, basically, I, I started running this club because all my kids were old enough to make it. I was, I was doing a lot of childcare before 2017, getting my kids to and from school. Uh, but, by the time they were all teenagers, they could all get themselves to and from school. Uh, and so what started as a hobby, I now realized that, uh, you know, I'd done something new. I was told that this work was probably publishable. Uh, you know, so I thought that's somewhere quite an appealing idea to write a paper with a couple of undergraduates. And, uh, and we did, we eventually, we, we made it better. I got more undergraduates involved. I now have a paper with four, four undergraduates and another, and another researcher where we did schemes in like three different ways. Uh, and I'm rather proud that I've written a paper with four undergraduates, which is what, which is what I mean. it's been accepted for publication. Uh, so that was kind of nice. And as I say, the, the question is, you know, maybe the, the problem with the weak undergraduates is that those people were struggling. They were struggling enough with the course and somehow learning to learning to use a computer, <laughs> learning a complicated programming language was just, you know, asking them much too much. But the students that weren't struggling, uh, you know, teaching them a programming language, especially those interested in computers, and there are many undergraduates now interested in computers, because computers, you know, undergraduates have never known a life without computers, right? And computer learning to program is something that's becoming more natural now to these people. They learn it at school. You know, my daughter was learning it in primary school at the age of seven. So can we use these systems to teach undergraduates and graduate students about schemes? And furthermore, I mean, schemes is MSc level mathematics. I learned about schemes as an MSc student. You know, how, much, how much more stuff can, can these systems handle? 
So I decided, you know, this was the next project. This was not with the undergraduates. I decided that, uh, you know, I was making a noise about this sort of thing on social media and other mathematicians were coming along. They were sort of showing up in the loom show. And uh, so Johann Kommelin is a postdoc in Freiburg. He's another number theorist. And Masso is a topologist in Orsay. And uh, by 2019, we'd defined perfectoid spaces in loom which was just some random thing we chose because it was like a vastly complex definition. Schultz got the Fields Medal uh, for defining perfectoid spaces in 2018 and then going on to uh, you know, prove some profound theorems about them. We didn't prove any profound theorems about them, but we, you know, we made the definition because we thought it would be good public relations. We just thought it would attract other people and it did. So again, I would just bang on about this sort of thing on Twitter. And uh, more mathematicians would just show up on the lean chats and say, oh, I'm, you know, this looks interesting. I'm interested in perfectoid spaces, or I'm interested in you know, algebraic geometry, or I'm interested in work of Peter Schultzer. You know, what, what needs to be done? And so basic algebraic geometry started appearing, basic commutative algebra. Uh, you know, the undergraduate syllabus just started appearing. And, uh, and it sort of turns out that uh, that sort of thing just wasn't there before. These systems have been being used by computer scientists for decades, but on the whole, they've never concentrated on even formalizing an entire undergraduate curriculum. I mean, there are certain systems where parts of the curriculum have been done, but uh, in 2019, no system had manifolds. It, it was just, you know, we had perfectoid spaces, but we didn't have real manifolds, which is something, something you learn as an undergraduate. In fact, in Lee, we didn't have graphs, right? <laughs> we didn't have the concept of a graph in 2019. And we have perfectoid spaces because it all, you know, the, the development, it all depends on who's involved, you see. Uh, so these computer science people had sort of been making other things, things in other systems and perhaps not concentrating on, you know, getting a full undergraduate curriculum because that's the beginning, right? That's the first thing we should do to teach a full undergraduate curriculum to one system. I mean, that sounds like a basic, important thing. We still haven't done it in Lean. We still haven't proved Stokes' theorem for manifolds, but we're really nearly there. So, you know, we've, we've something that was not done for a long time, class group of a number field is finite. Now, this was not done for a long time. A PhD student of mine did it. She's got a paper now. Uh, this paper has been accepted. She's proved class group of a number field is finite. This is something I teach to the third year undergraduates. So uh, my talk's almost done. I have a uh, Four slides left, and uh, the last four, you know, the last four slides are, you know, just briefly, you know, how can, how, how, you know, the, the question I've been thinking about for a long time, uh, how can we get other mathematicians to use this software? And lastly, really, something I haven't talked about, but why, right? Why should mathematicians be using this software? I mean, it's, it's kind of cool and it's fun, uh, but should people actually be investing a lot of time into it? You know, I think th these are important questions. So how, uh, this is something I'm beginning to get the hang of, right? There's two, there's two obvious approaches. The first, the first thing is just, you know, teach, teach it to young people and then wait for the revolution to happen. Uh, you know, just, just, you know, forget about the staff, you know, just concentrate on the undergraduates. Uh, teach young people to do the kind of mathematics they know in these systems, because right now, uh, it's not done. And even when it is done, it doesn't stop you doing it again. Uh, I, I worked I worked with a project student over the summer and an undergraduate, and we redeveloped group theory from scratch. Uh, we, we, you know, up to the proof of Sulov's theorems. You know, th this stuff is in Lean, or at least the first Sulov theorem is in Lean. Uh, we developed group theory again. We redefined a group and uh, we built the entire theory from scratch just to, just to, just to see how it was done, really. Uh, our proofs are much more, our proofs are written by mathematicians, not computer scientists. So they're much more comprehensible. There's lots of comments uh, that explain what's going on. And we had to develop our own theory of finiteness just because we wanted to. And we proved Sulov's theorems. And uh, yeah, it was a, just a very interesting experience. Uh, and, you know, the, the other thing, which is something I'm doing now, is uh, to, we're doing modern research level work, you know, to make the researchers, to make young researchers interested. So let me just briefly say some things about uh, uh, young people doing MSc level mathematics and things. Uh, here's an example of a young person, Bavik Mehta. Uh, I met him, you know, I met him on the internet uh, at the very end of 2019. And uh, 
started encouraging and he was interested in combinatorics he'd done in ray he'd done he'd done in ray leaders uh part three combinatorics course in cambridge and i said oh yeah that stuff should be really nice to formalize and do and uh, he formalized the kruskal katana theorem i should uh i should maybe switch i'll, I'll show you uh i'll show you what he did i probably uh let me see if I can find. Ha, curses. Uh, let me see if I can find this stuff. Yeah, it'll be here somewhere. There's, let me Google Chris. Let me just find it. There you go. Katana. Lean. That should do it. Uh, here we are. Combinatorics in Lean. So here's um. So he wrote a really nice. He wrote a website explaining the statement of the theorem. Uh, and explain, you know, all the lemmas he proved on the way. And there's a sort of a PDF. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a PDF that explains what's going on. Uh, but this is just some, you know, combinatorics of finite sets. And this was, to me, was just more evidence that combinatorics is relatively straightforward to do in Lean, which I think is important, especially, for, you know, for people like you. Uh, if you want to consider playing with this stuff, then you might be able to start, you know, doing the kind of things that you think about in real life. Whereas if you come along and you want to do perfectoid spaces or you know, difficult arithmetic algebraic geometry, the kind of thing that you know, my colleagues do, it might be difficult to even get started. Uh, but combinatorics is going really well. And since then, he's moved on to category theory. He's made major contributions to the category theory library. And now he's just doing basic convex geometry you know, because it, he wants to do some kind of combinatorial stuff and he needed convex geometry. And now he's developed convex geometry and he's got an undergraduate on board in Cambridge. And they're just making this stuff. They hang out on my Discord server, and uh, it's it's going great. You know, they make progress. You know, it, there's been a huge amount of progress over Easter because you know, they've both been on holidays at there, and now you know it's quieter because you know, they're sort of back at you know the undergraduates got exams, but uh, then the undergraduate's going to be doing a project with them all summer. So we're going to have a, a, you know the undergraduate is very smart as a Cambridge undergraduate. We're going to get a lot of convex geometry. Uh, Chris Hughes uh, is an MSc student of mine. I picked him up in the first year. Uh, he's doing. He's now doing an MSc. He's doing an MSc project with me, and uh, he was interested in uh, group theory. So uh, we got it. We got interested in the word problem, uh, insolvability of the word problem. He didn't prove. He could have proved that theorem, but in fact, he's done something much more useful. Uh, he's developing tactics uh, which solve the word problem in finitely presented groups. Uh, and so he's, for example, he's developed a tactic which really does solve the word problem in a one related group. So you can, you can, it can prove all statements of the form, you know, this, this implies this. If I've got some, you know, G times H times J equals G implies J times H is the identity, that sort of thing. He has a tactic which will, you know, you just type in that tactic and the goal is solved. And he has other tactics as well, which will take several hypotheses and uh, try, attempt to come to a conclusion. And they'll, and they'll, I think they will always terminate if the conclusion is true. And if you're trying to prove something false, they might go into an infinite loop. But of course, you know, you shouldn't be trying to prove false things, right? It's your own fault. Uh, so he's he's done a lot of manipulations of words in the, and and uh, you know, the, the way to internally store free groups and things like this. So we're in sort of prime position uh, to start to start proving theorems about uh, about words in group theory. Uh, because we have all the machinery, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you explicitly, if you're interested in dabbling with this stuff, then what I'm saying, you know, normally when I talk to number theorists, I say, well, you know, you want to do algebraic geometry, we've still got a mountain to climb. Uh, but if you're interested in doing combinatorics and words, and combinatorics on words, uh, then the system is kind of ready for you now. Uh, so I personally, as I say, I'm trying to get more researchers interested. Uh, and this, you know, at the end of last year, I had a huge boost here because Schultz had challenged uh, the formalization communities to uh, to prove one of his theorems. Uh, I mean, this is something I don't particularly want to talk about, but uh, I I start one of the reasons I got interested in this was I was having a crisis. You know, I had a bit of a midlife crisis. I was concerned that a lot of modern algebraic geometry wasn't really being checked correctly, uh, and I thought that maybe these systems could check this stuff correctly. And, and now I realize it's just far too tall an order in some sense. Uh, but on the other hand, Schultz was also Schultz was also feeling the same way. He had some preprint out 
and he wasn't convinced that uh, you know, the details are being checked. So he said, I'm specifically interested in making sure that a certain theorem I proved is correct. So can you formalize you know, this theorem you proved with Klaus and uh, can, you, can you check it in lean for us? I mean, or check it in any theorem prover. And uh, this got some more traction here. People appeared, people are working on this and it's gonna happen. I would say, uh, you know, we, we, we have, a, we broke it up into, you know, we, we've got some theorem which is about halfway through and then we've got the main theorem after that. And for the halfway through, halfway through theorem, we're really nearly there. Uh, I'm struggling away with some combinatorics now. I'm trying to prove Gordon's lemma. Uh, that's going to be done soon. And that's one of the last pieces in the puzzle. Uh, so very soon we're going to be able to announce that we proved a theorem of Schultz. Uh, but we haven't quite proved the theorem he wants us to prove. Uh, but I don't see any reason why we, why we can't do this. And then, so that will be some more noise. And really, though, from my point of view, the point isn't the theorem. The point is that every time we try and prove a very difficult mathematical theorem, uh, we discover more holes in the library. We discover parts of the library which are difficult to use, and you know, discover parts of the library where we could do better, and it makes the library better. So now, if people come along and they want to use, you know, they want to use things like uh, you know, subsets of finitely generated abelian groups, you know, things are better now. If they want to, if they want to use normed groups, uh, we had a definition of a normed group for a year or so, but now we have. You know, now we have lots of theorems about normed groups because we needed them, uh, because we wanted to prove things about normed group objects in the category of condensed abelian groups, this sort of thing. Uh, so we've been forced to develop some parts of the theory more. Uh, this, is, this, this is something I've learned, that if you want to drive the theory forward, you, you want to make the library better, then you choose a very, very hard goal, and you push, you push towards it. And at the end of it, you get sloppy, and you just prove exactly what you need. But for the earlier stuff, you're really forced to you know, develop a robust library. So Lean's maths library is just getting really, really good uh, now uh, because we're, we're pushing it to do difficult things. So lastly, this is the last slide really, why? Uh, and I can think of all sorts of reasons. So here's just a bunch of bullet points really. So firstly, you know, we could gamify undergraduate level mathematics and uh, I think that you know once we've made the system easier to use, it will make for better teaching. Once we've really made it so that it is easy to use, uh, then hopefully more undergraduates will come along and you know start trying to understand their problem sheets and their, the courses they're learning, and start trying to do this stuff in Lean. Uh, I think there's real potential there. Uh, we need to think more about education. I've stopped thinking so much about education now. I'm really concentrating more on the research side of this stuff. Uh, of course, you know once we've got once we've got all students doing it, we computers mark homework, right? One of the big problems I have at Imperia is I have 300 undergraduates and it's very difficult to give them individualized feedback. Uh, you know, for 300 first year students in my course, you know, we, hire, you know, we have 10, 10 PhD students working with me, but then that still breaks it down into groups of 30, which is still much too big. You know, when I was an undergraduate in Cambridge, I was taught in groups of two. Uh, and you just get much better feedback here. But computers also give you feedback. You know, computers say, I don't understand this part of your proof. And uh, when eventually they do understand it, they say, your proof is correct. Uh, so you get, instant, you know, it's like, I don't know if this works. And if the computer says, yes, it works, then it works. And if the computer says, no, I don't get this bit, then you can see where the problem is. Uh, I was annoyed as an undergraduate by textbooks with you know, errors in. Uh, you know, if you make a new kind of textbook that somehow has lean integrated as the back end, this would this would easily be feasible. Uh, you know, I've made I made this thing called the natural number game, uh, which is some kind of teaching resource, uh, but it's some inter interactive you know thing that it, it teaches you something goofy, right? It teaches you that proving that a add b equals b add a on the natural numbers is harder than you think. Uh, but this could be used to do you know more traditional undergraduate teaching. Uh, we're beginning to do algebraic geometry. You know, we've proved it's possible. Uh, you know, writing proofs in this stuff, in this, in this still takes a while. But if we just want to write statements of theorems, that's very quick, right? And there are gigantic databases online of theorem statements. And even just typing in the theorem statements uh, enables computers to start searching. You know, Lean can Lean knows if, if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. So if you if you ask it, you know, is this theorem in algebraic geometry true? 
if Lee knew all of these, you know, these thousands of PDF pages that we have in the SACS project, you know, this is, a, this is an online resource for algebraic geometry. If we just start integrating that with Lean, then after a while, Lean will, you know, start being good at modern algebraic geometry in the sense that it will just make basic deductions from known facts. You know, if you knew everything that was in the SACS project, then all of a sudden you're going to be a really good algebraic geometer. If you know all the proofs and all the counterexamples, even all the statements of the theorems, you're suddenly going to be a much better algebraic geometer than me. And, uh, but teaching them all to one person is difficult, but teaching them all to one computer is, is, is definitely feasible. Just teaching the statements of a large corpus of mathematics to a computer. You know, then, then we will have an interesting thing. Uh, you know, why not fully formalize a degree? You know, it's nearly at the point now where I can just take our final year exams and formalize the statements. And so I can say, look at this, you know, we can ask a computer, we can attempt to write a tactic that solves undergraduate problems. That's not really a, a, something that I could work on, but that's something that the AI people can work on. And I think that once we've got to the, the point where we can type in all the questions, then you have to start letting the AI people type in all the, you know, generate generate machines that type in all the answers. Uh, you know, can they help? Can they help researchers? You know, this is this is once once Lee knows your area, there's a chance that Lee can start doing tedious checks for you. Uh, you, know, you just you just say, oh well, this should be obvious. But instead of spending an hour grinding out the details yourself and checking, you know, dotting the i's and crossing the t's, why don't you just say, well, this should be provable by induction? You write down a sketch of the proof, and then you ask Lee if it can fill in the details, do all the tedious bits for you. This is this is somehow a sort of it's sort of part dream, part reality at this point, right? You know, the the, the you know the the last thing is you know, once it once we do have large databases of mathematics, then the AI people will come in. You know, these AI people just constantly are telling us that they think that computers are going to be proving theorems that humans can't prove within ten years. You know, they're constantly saying this, uh, but this sort of might be the way to make it happen, and that would be sort of a very interesting development. Uh, but that's not really something I know anything about. So the less I say about it, the better. So that's the end of what I have to say. Thank you. And uh, and here are the ads. <laughs> um, oh, thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Kevin? So do you think your students learned any mathematics that they really understood as opposed to just satisfying the lines of a program? From the textbook. I can't see who's speaking, but you sound awfully like someone I know. <laughs> that may be true. Ah, oh, it, it really is. How are you? Hi. How are you? you doing okay? I'm great. Thank you, Kevin. That, that's great. Uh, nice to know. Uh, so uh, I did teach a, some smart undergraduates what schemes were, but that was because they had to. I made them read a book, right? Uh, I sort of said, here's, you know, here's some online resources that talk about schemes. Now prove to me that you can under, now, you know, you could go away and say you've read them, or you could go away and prove to me you've read them by actually convincing a computer that you've read them. So I think that is one way of teaching. I don't think it's, the, I don't think it's the best way of teaching for sure. But okay, it's something about schemes. Schemes. <laughs> about schemes. I mean, there's a lot of background into why on earth you'd even make such a definition. What is the point? How does it fit into a big picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't learn that at all. They learn the for they learn the formalization of it. They learn how to dot all the i's and cross all the t's in a formal definition of a scheme, and they have absolutely no idea why schemes revolutionized algebraic geometry. So, and, and similarly, you can you can lecture you know a, a standard. You can prove that a standard epsilon delta proof, and then you can say to the students, "Prove to me you've understood this." And uh, you, it is it, the point is it is important. I think it is important to make sure that students absolutely know how an epsilon delta proof works. And, and then watching you write down five on the board maybe isn't good enough. But then writing down some approximation to this on a piece of paper that maybe nobody ever looks at, or maybe a graduate student who's got to mark 30 of these things and is really bored and it's just half checking them. You know, it, it doesn't pick up on the subtle slips you're making. You're, you know, just, oh, this looks right. The, the point is the, compu the computer will make sure you understand it properly, but the computer will not give you the insight. You know, you have, a, you have an overview 
of what's going on in your area, right? This this pretentious stuff you're doing is 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 you know a, a new way of thinking about about analytic number theory, and that's very much not what's happening here. What's happening here is we have a very autistic and extremely pedantic thing saying, you know, now convince me convince me that one is not equal to two. So it's, it's just a different aspect, but yeah, it's by no means everything. Sorry, let me ask another question. Philosophically, do you think, I mean, one of the issues with human proof is that, that ambiguities can slip in to your thinking and there can be mistakes in proof. Um, I think before the talk, Jeff Shallot was pointing some things out in English language where certain phrases can be interpreted in two ways. <laughs> so my question is, do you really believe that your library evades all such ambiguities? Yes, it does. Because, uh, because everything has to have a precise definition. And furthermore, it catches human ambiguities. Uh, for example, my student, Chris Hughes, when he was formalizing, uh, when he was formalizing Andy, Put Andy Putnam, and he's a wise guy, and he wrote stuff, he wrote a document that Hughes was formalizing for his MFT project. And he used two different notions of the length of a word in a, in a free group. Like you a, a squared times B times A, right? So has that got length three or has it got length four? And it turned out that he was using both uses of length uh, in a proof of his and it actually mattered. So when Hughes was formalizing because he caught this and uh, Putman had to sort of fix his, uh, had, to, had to fix his. So yeah, we do, we do it's, it, it does fix that because everything has to be precisely written. And you know, there, there, are ups, there are advantages and disadvantages to this, right? Because if you want to use the other notion of length, you're going to have to call it length primed or something. Uh, but yeah, everything is precise. And the, the goal, what, what, as a result, one thing you have to check is that if Lean says, I prove, this is, this is where the issue is. If Lean says, I've proved this theorem, then you have to look very, very carefully at exactly what Lean means by every single you know, symbol that's in this. You only have to analyze the statement but you have to look very, very carefully. You know, it can say, I proved Fermat's last theorem, but then you've got to check that by, when it says the natural numbers, it means the natural numbers we care about. When it says addition, it means the addition we care about, right? You could easily make it look like it's proved Fermat's last theorem by just redefining equality or redefining addition. So that's where, that's where you have to be careful. Lynn says, I've done X. You know, I, I've proved X's theorem. Well, that's no good because you look on Wikipedia and there's three things called X's theorem. You have, to, you have to make sure what it means. But what lean means is a well-defined, precise thing. This might not be what you mean. Okay. Hey, thank you. Stepan, you've had your hand up for a long time, sorry. Yes. Uh, hi, Kevin, thank you for, for the talk. I, I, have a, I have a project actually in Isabel. Uh, on, oh, great. Uh, formalizing, I'm formalizing combinatorics on words. Right? Oh, brilliant. Yes. So, so I'm I'm aware of you know these culture wars between you know, dependent uh, type theory and simple type theory, and uh, stuff like that. But of course, I, I I think you pointed out that, and that's correct. That in combinatorics on words, probably all this doesn't matter, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we are not we are not doing any fashionable mathematics. Uh, of, oh, uh, you know. I, I tend to shy uh, away from these. <laughs> but, 2019, when I was having my nervous breakdown, I would say all sorts of but, things. You know, so, so so actually, my my question would be as, as follows: So, uh, since you have to 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 make this 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 hard decision, like whether to go with th this community or that community. Uh, and to invest your, you know, to this, this steep lean, leaning, um, uh, learning curve into, into lean or Isabel. So, so my question would be on this level of, of combinatorics uh, like this uh, Cruz Calcatona or combinatorics on words, yeah. is it already somehow easy to transfer the proofs from from lean to isabel or backwards yeah uh, no, I, I think so yeah i think so and why not right you know because i think that the proofs that i am writing in isabel down you know they are just you know they are just easy you know that yeah, the steps yeah. are easy so so yeah, i think that yeah. the lean should understand them yeah yeah i absolutely agree uh and the computer scientists tell me that this is a phenomenally difficult problem they say it's the same it, i think that best answer I've been given to this is maybe the following. 
you could in theory write something that translated from one to the other, but the, the two system, different systems have different idiomatic ways to do things. And your beautiful Isabel proof might translate into some disgusting, horrible lean proof, which fights against parts of the system and is somehow far too long. And it's not really the kind of thing you would want a human to read. So I would say instead, actually, you go ahead and keep working on Isabel and tell these combinatorics on words people that they should learn Isabel instead, because I don't think that one system dominating is a good idea. And Isabel is a spectacularly strong system for mathematics. And if more mathematicians were using it, you know, I don't think a monopoly is ever good. I think all of these systems are perfectly good for mathematics. Isabel, Isabel, Holcock, and Ling. And we should, we should have serious libraries in all three of them and active math, mathematician communities. Right? That's, that's, we need more mathematicians in every one of these communities. And then we will begin to understand which system is actually the one that we should be concentrating on. Because right now it's just me going, lean, 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 it's really good. But we need, we need an Isabel version of me and a Cock version of me, to, you know, rallying the troops with these systems as well. Keep going with Isabel or switch. It's up to you. <laughs> it's, yeah, Thanks. But, but, but we can't move from one to the other yet. This is a computer science problem. I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, Pe Petra has, has her hand up. Yes, um, hello. Oh. Uh, earlier in your talk, first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. And um, also for emphasizing how this, how automated uh, proof generation for correct theorems um, and um, this can be used also in teaching undergraduates and in emphasizing the importance of being very, very particular in your, um, well, in the way you write things, not changing the for all it's, and there it's exists. important, yeah. Yes, yes, it's very important um, because one of the things, uh, one of the aspects is that when you're teaching students that, sometimes they think, oh, it's just the lecturer that's being pedantic, <laughs> overall, you know, very picky, and actually it's all right if we just forget them, there exists, or something like that. Um, but when you've got a program again, um, when you're working against a program, there is no, you know, yeah. pedantry or anything like that. It is a program, and it tells you that it is right or wrong. Um, this is earlier, what mathematics is it says you you can't yeah. divide by zero because this is what mathematics is so you can't divide by x you've got to say that x isn't zero yes yes exactly exactly so it it can actually i mean it can be very useful in that aspect in the aspect of teaching students why it is so important to be careful what they're dividing by and what they're actually doing and to spell out each step Earlier in your talk, you mentioned that you're not really sure why um, mathematicians aren't picking up on this, maybe. Uh, maybe I misheard, but um, I wanted to point out that um, in some areas, not so much combinatorics in words, but in general topology, so in the classical set theoretic topology, some mathematicians have picked this up um, um, and have been working on this for a couple of years, maybe a decade now. Um, and there's this thing called Pi Base. So just to add to the list, um, we've already down. mentioned Isabel and uh, Stacks, and um, maybe somebody will or has already mentioned Walnut, which um, Isabel and Walnut are more related to the combinatorics in words. But Pi Base um, has been very useful in general topology because there are quite a lot of different notions floating around. So unless you're very well versed, it's difficult to check through all of them and um, maybe form sensible and non-trivial hypotheses. Oh. And in, in that sense, uh, it has been very useful to have something which automatically gives you um, either proofs or examples of spaces and say, let's say I want a separable space which has this, this, and this property and this yeah. compactness property or something like that. And um, in that sense, it has been very useful for informing hypotheses, let's right. say. Right, there's counterexamples in topology book. That would be a fun yeah. thing to, uh, 
Yeah, formalize. they started. They started with formalizing the counterexamples in topology, and then um, co continued and are open to expansion for other types. And, of and this is called pi base. Yes. Yeah. All one word. P I B. Uh, uh, it is just pi, like um, the letter. Oh, like uh, the, the number. Greek letter, and then yeah. base, um, which pi. Um, Having Wonderful. a pi base is also another topological cool. property. Oh, I see. Well, thank you very much. I, I like to chase up these things. As, as I say, I think I'll probably still spend most of my time doing lean, but I mm -hmm. I do want to know what's going on because yes, I want yeah. to somehow. I, I think that I, three years ago, it was just lean, 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 but now I really want to advertise other systems as well. I only learned about Walnut when I was looking at the website today. I saw Jeff's I just know Jeff Shalit's uh, abstract for next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So th yes, thank you. No problem. Thank you for the talk and you know just putting this out there. Yeah. Uh, cool. I the, see no more hand. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes. How do you lower your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just mouse really over yourself in the participants. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Andrew's back. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Yeah. You, I mean, you didn't push too hard on this, but you talked a bit at the end about proving new theorems. Um, to, my, to my taste, then you can argue with me. You're, you're looking at theorems that are kind of in a, in a fixed box that you pretty much know where all the parameters work and behave. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was just trying to think of theorems where it's very hard to get a handle on parameters. So you take something like Zemeredi's regularity lemma, oh. then um, there are many variables that you think about. It's not true. It's not, you can't, you can't prove a theorem with small things. Tim Gowers showed a few years ago that there, the, the size at which things start to become true is double exponentially large. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, there's this great flight of genius from Zemeredi, and, and there have been other proofs and people following up, and now it's fairly simple to write down a proof, but it's still so hard to have the intuition, especially as things are so big, where anything yeah. like this is really true. Yeah, but it's still, you can still follow the proof from line to line, right? That this, what, what is mathematics about? Is it, what is a, a proof is two things, right? Firstly, it's some formal stamp that this, that this statement is true. But secondly, also, it's supposed to give us some kind of intuition. And the, you know, lean only needs the formal stamp, right? The AI people will come up with the intuition later. But this Zemeredi regularity level is one of the things proposed by uh, this Cambridge undergraduate to be working on this summer with Babbitt. So you should prod me in September and ask, and ask how things are going, because I, well, Bolabash's book has like a three-page proof, so it's yeah, it's yeah. not impossible to copy no. that out in the formal no, exactly. formal way. Yeah, th things things become about four times longer when you write them in lean. But for instance, if you, I mean, maybe you don't want to talk about if you were trying to prove a new theorem. Just no, the this, this, all this does right now is check old theorems. Right. How do you quantify when when everything's so ephemeral, like in uh, like in Zemeredi's theorem? I mean, you know, the, the sort of not small examples to test it on. Everything's very big. You've got to get everything in the right. Write, uh, you just write the proof in the same way you'd write it in a textbook. Well, no, but you're talking about proof. I'm trying to, I'm sort of more interested now in could you prove something new and especially right, yeah, on something that, that isn't in a small box. Right. And the answer to that is we, you have to talk, you have to get an AI person in to talk <laughs> okay. because the AI people are full of ideas and, and AI is kind of advancing quickly. You know, they couldn't do computer vision and then, you know, then some, somebody came along and said, oh, here's how to do it. And now they can do computer vision. And now they're making self-driving cars. And you know, so that's Christian Zegede, he works at Google with a PhD in maths. He, as I say, he told me in 2019, he said, give us 10 years and, and we'll be proving new theorems. But I don't really understand how they do it. It'd be, it'd be just like chess. You know? If you're an expert chess player, you have some kind of insight and a feeling as to you know, wh where to look on the board. And, you know, where the actions happen and uh, mobility and subtle concepts like this. But chess computers still beat humans by just some brute force and a different kind of it. You know, they make their own insights using AI. 
and, and then brute force yeah. their weird insights win. I guess Google will prove by new theorems on the quantum computers. I mean, maybe, but it does. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that Zegedy might say. But uh, they've been saying that for about 15, 20 years. Exactly, so. exactly. This is the this is the problem. Apparently, computer scientists have been saying they're going to be proving theorems that mathematicians can't prove forever now. You know, ever since this whole thing appeared, like you know, 30 odd years ago, they've been saying, just give us 10 years. So but but you know, this is ultimately the goal. I'm gonna I'm trying to put myself out of business here, right? And, you know, I can't. I don't want to be doing number theory. Like if I can get a machine to do it for me, well, that's progress, right? But the thing is, my from talking to the AI people, the AI people sort of say, well, first of all, why don't you write down the number theory you know, and then we'll take it from there. So, <laughs> so I'm going to spend 15 years doing that. And I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to get to the end of it. But that's the plan. Modular forms are in the pipeline, so we're getting there. I've got a student working with me on elliptic curves. Wow. All these, all these things, all these things happen. And uh, once they're done, once they're done. So does anyone have any, any other questions? Um, if not, um, I'll just uh, I'll say thank you again to, to Kevin for participating in our seminar, for accepting our invitation, and for giving us a really interesting talk. So thank you so much. Thanks for coming, all of you.